This is Software Engineering Radio, the podcast for professional developers on the web at se-radio.net. SE Radio brings you relevant and detailed discussions about software engineering topics at least once a month. Thanks to our audience and the partners listed on our website for supporting the podcast. This is Robert for Software Engineering Radio. I'm at the O'Reilly Strata Conference in Santa Clara, California, Jonathan Ellis. Jonathan is the project chair of the Apache Cassandra project. And the Jonathan and I will be talking about the Cassandra Open Source Database project. Jonathan, please tell the listeners about your background. My background is uh, before I started Cassandra, I built a pretty simple Cassandra project. Uh, then I had practice where I was asked to building a scalable database, and that's how I got involved in Cassandra. Tell us briefly, what is Cassandra? Cassandra is a scalable database that mixes the best of the Google Big Table approach and the Amazon Dynamo approach. Uh, specifically, uh, Google's Big Table proposes uh, a log structured storage system that's highly efficient uh, on its modern storage for write, as well as for uh, as well as keeping the performance deep. While the Amazon Dynamo system gives you a fully distributed model for uh, replicating uh, and partitioning data with no single point of failure, and Cassandra gives you the best of both worlds there. Tell us a bit about the history of the project. So Cassandra was started at Facebook uh, and open sourced in the summer of 2000, uh, 2008, I believe. And I got involved uh, later that year uh, when the project moved to the Apache Foundation. And we started uh, uh, building the community from there in the Apache Incubator and uh, graduated in April of last year. And uh, we just released our 07 version uh, in January. Why are people now looking at alternatives to relational databases? It's mostly because, uh, I, I, well, there's a couple reasons. You have this this whole NoSQL general uh, term for anything that's not a relational database. And there's there's all kinds of, of systems under that rubric. Uh, but I think I think the really interesting problem is is the one of scale. That uh, relational databases weren't designed to scale, uh, don't do it particularly well. And uh, in fact, if you, you can you can make a relational system scale by partitioning it and uh, you know adding enough duct tape and bailing wire, but what you end up with is uh, it's two things. Is one it, it's it's very ad hoc and one off ish. Uh, you you can't take uh, an architecture that partitions a relational database for you know, eBay and and run you know Amazon's infrastructure on top of that, even though they're both you know e-commerce sites. Uh, the other is is that when you do this, when you when you take a relational system and you partition it and you make it scale, you're giving up. You 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 have to give up the benefits that make you want to choose a relational system in the first place. You know, your your acid guarantees. So. Uh, you know, companies that are running into you know these, these big data problems are are taking a look at this and saying you know either we can build a one-off uh, that doesn't doesn't really take advantage of uh, the strengths of the relational platform, or I can go with a system that's designed for this kind of new breed of application and and uh, gives me some some benefits to make up for giving up asset. People are are trying to rethink the problem in a more fundamental way and not just get stuck with certain trade-offs you get by trying to fit the round peg in a square hole. Yeah, I, th I think so. I think that more and more companies are running into you know, data sets and query volumes that can't be handled by single machine databases anymore. And uh, and once you start partitioning, then then uh, these, these uh, scalable database like Cassandra is going to be a better fit for your application. Would you accept the division into the non-relational stores into key value stores, document-oriented, and big table type column family? 
Um, yeah, I think I, I wrote uh, I wrote an article a couple years ago called the NoSQL ecosystem, and uh, you know, one of the things I talked about there is that there's several different axes on which to evaluate uh, a database. One of them is the data model. You know, that's that's what you're talking about here with document versus key value versus column family. But there, there's other important factors to to keep in mind when evaluating these systems. Uh, one of one of which is uh, not only what's the data model, but what's the storage model, which are related, uh, but not the same thing. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, there's a, a database called Reoc by a company named Fasho, and it gives you a document data model, but it's implemented uh, in terms of uh, pluggable key value systems. So uh, you can, you know, run it on top of uh, BDB or on top of uh, Bitcast, which is uh, a, a new key value single machine database that they wrote to, to back React. Uh, so, so there's, uh, you know, very different characteristics depending on the, the implementation there. Uh, you know, in the same vein, you have uh, CouchDB also gives you a document data model. But that's implemented in terms of append-only B trees. So the performance characteristics of uh, you know, Bitcast versus uh, CouchDB versus uh, MongoDB, you know, are, are quite different. Let's talk about the data model, Cassandra. Give us an overview of the main concepts in the data model. So Cassandra uh, takes the uh, data model primarily from uh, Google's Big Table and divides the world up into uh, key spaces and column families, which correspond to schemas and tables in a relational database. Now, the, the difference between a column family and a table uh, is that, well, there's a couple differences. One is that uh, uh, the columns in your rows in a Cassandra column family are sort of... Uh, you know, it's not it's not schema less because you can annotate columns and say this column will be of this type, and I want you to enforce that for me. Uh, but it's uh, it's a it's a sparse model because you can have uh, you can use columns in your rows without pre-declaring them if you want to, and then you can later add the metadata about the data tap type, or or you can just leave it as as a as a column full of bytes, and, and Cassandra, Cassandra's okay with that. Uh, so, so one of the differences is then that you, you, you don't have to uh, uh, reallocate each row in your table to add a column. So you, you can think of either alter table as being optional, or you can think of it as much higher performance uh, than, than what you would have in a, in a B3-based system. And either of those ways of thinking about it uh, is correct. You uh, have made a distinction between more of a static schema, although it's not really enforced by the server, versus more of a dynamic schema where you freely add columns. Sure. Yeah, so I, I like to think of modeling uh, applications in Cassandra in terms of two sort of classes of column family uh, that I, I call static and dynamic column families. And I, I'm, I'm using static and dynamic in kind of the sense of uh, you know, how much change is going on at runtime rather than in, in the sense of uh, you know, static versus dynamic typing or something. So in other words, a, a static column family would be a column family that you know, the rows are representing objects uh, in your application, for instance. So they all have more or less the same columns. Uh, you may, you may, you know, six months into deploying your website, uh, decide that you're going to have users provide you with an SMS number as well as an email address to contact them. And so you can just, you, you know, by not having to do an alter table, your application can just start putting in that SMS number you know, without having to do any extra work on the, uh, you know, on the DBA side. Uh, but you know you still have most most of your rows you know share the same set of columns just by convention. Uh, then the other way, the other kind of column family is is where we uh, use a column family to represent uh, you know, materialized views in a single row. 
And uh, th this is where, when we did our 07 release, one of the things that a lot of uh, news stories picked up on was that uh, Cassandra 07 can now have up to 2 billion columns in a single row. Uh, you know, the old limitation was you can have up to 2 gigabytes worth of data in a single row uh, because we were representing you know, the size field on disk as, as a 32-bit uh, integer. Uh, and so now, now the now the limit has has become you know, the number of columns is, is two billion, and the, the size is basically limited by your disk space. Uh, so the but so either way, we're talking about really large numbers of columns compared to what you would have in a relational system. And the reason is is that uh, it's not because we're insane, but it's because we're 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 providing you with a tool to avoid joins. Because uh, you know, even in even in a relational system, uh, you know, people learn to avoid joins uh, for you know maximum performance. Uh, but you know, that's even more important in a distributed system where rows in different tables or different column families could live on different machines altogether. And so the price of doing the expensiveness of doing that join goes up even further because you're dealing with network latency as. And, and not just um, you know, data that's all local to a single machine. So, so we really want to emphasize avoiding join. And, and having the ability to put you know, millions or billions of columns in a single row lets us denormalize uh, your, your query result set and pre-compute it into one of these rows. Uh, you know, for, for instance, uh, one of one of the sort of teaching examples we have of doing Cassandra, uh, you know, development is uh, a toy Twitter clone called Twisandra. So if you go to twisandra.com, uh, there's a there's a live demo and there's a link to the GitHub source and it it's written in Python on top of Django, but it, it's 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 and one of the nice things about Python is it's quite readable even if you don't really have a Python background. Uh, so so it. It's a pretty good example, even if you're a Java programmer or a Perl programmer or whatever. Uh, but one of the things, you know, the core, the core query you make in Twitter is, you know, what tweets have my friends made? And so the, the way you would model this in a relational database is you would have a table for tweets and a table for users and a table uh, to relate users to other users to say, who are my friends? And then you would, if you want to say, give me the 50 most recent tweets that my friends have made, uh, then you know what, what you're doing is you, you first you have to say, well, what is the set of tweets my friends have made? And I compute that by, by going through these join tables. And then I, I can pull out those tweet rows, sort them by time, and give you back the result. It's a pretty uh, simple design problem for anyone who's read a book about relational databases using a normalized model. Right. So how would you do that with Cassandra to take advantage of Cassandra's data models? So the, the, the way you would uh, do that in Cassandra is I would have uh, a single row. I, I would have a separate column family that would be you know, where I answer this query from of what tweets have my friends made. Uh, and Twisandra calls that the timeline column family. And so I would have a row in that column family for each user, and the columns in that row are going to be the tweets. I, I will denormalize each tweet that someone makes into uh, the timeline row of the people who follow him. In the relational model, the idea you normalize everything, every piece of data is in one place. You can always find the data you want if you're willing to do enough joins. Whereas with Cassandra, it sounds like what you do is think about the queries that you're going to do and then create one storage class for each query. Each query. Right. That's exactly right. And, you know, you, there's, uh, you know, you, you, what, what we typically see at, uh, at Datastax when people come to us and say, hey, you know, we're writing this application against uh, Cassandra, can you review our data model, is, uh, you know, because Cassandra does give you this rows and columns uh, sort of uh, uh, view of the world, uh, they'll treat it like a slightly brain-damaged uh, relational database, and, th and they'll uh, do 
you know, all their joins, uh, client side and, 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 and still have this sort of normalized, uh, data model only in Cassandra. And that's, that's, you know, Cassandra tries to push you away from that into, into this denormalized model, uh, you know, to save you from yourself because that, that's, that's how you're going to get, uh, you know, really good performance and, and having basically best in class write performance lets us say, hey, you know, creating those extra copies, you know, isn't as expensive as you're used to thinking it as. So go ahead and, and, and spend some, uh, writes, you know, at, at, uh, creation time to pre-compute those queries so that they're lightning fast. Suppose you're dealing with an application that has a bunch of different relations and there's many different queries that come first through A to B to C and then B to C to A and so on and you, you end up having 20 different queries. Is this a efficient way? Are people having success in building applications with dozens of different copies of the same data based on the number of ways they need to access it? Or is that just the wrong application for this data store? Uh, so, well, there, there, there's there's an important thing that that I haven't mentioned, which is that while Cassandra doesn't support joins, it does support indexes. So uh, this is something that you know certainly the the, the key value uh, type of databases you know, they don't give you that uh, kind of uh, you know, more sophisticated query capability. And Cassandra does. So, uh, you know, that, that does, that helps a lot where this, with, with this kind of application where you're saying that, you know, I, I have a lot of different combinations of, of, uh, you know, things I need to ask. And, and maybe, you know, pre-computing them all is combinatorially, uh, impractical. So having those, having those indexes that, that allow Cassandra to, uh, you know, Apply uh, predicates to your query at runtime uh, can can help with a lot of those situations. You know, that said, uh, you know if you have something that's you know truly uh, ad hoc queries at runtime, you know that's that's really uh, a super hard problem to scale. Uh, and the lack of joins makes it harder in one respect in Cassandra. Uh, but any system that's going to give you joins is going to give you a different set of problems. So I would say that Cassandra is probably about as good as anything else when you have the, that combination of, I need to be able to do those queries, but I also need to scale. I'd like to get more into the systems side of the project. From reading the paper, reading a paper from two Facebook guys about Cassandra, they said the major properties of Cassandra are distributed decentralized, scalable, highly available, fault-tolerant, and tunable consistency. Would you agree with that list? Yeah, I'd, I'd, say, that, I'd say that's still accurate. I'd maybe, I'd maybe add high performance. Let's talk about how, how does Cassandra achieve uh, distribution? Uh, there, there's a couple things that, that kind of fall under the distribution category. Uh, one is, uh, you know, how do I spread data across multiple machines and the other is you know how do I you know now that I have my data spread across multiple machines how do I make sure that I have you know, multiple copies of it uh, as well so the, the first that, that first part we call partitioning and the second part we call replication and because uh, both of those are uh, pluggable uh, you know, strategies in Cassandra uh, and most commonly, uh, the partitioning is done by a, a consistent hashing partitioner uh, called random partitioner, and, and that that uh, basically that that distributes uh, rows ar around the cluster by uh, the MD5 of their primary key. Now, replication is a little more uh, interesting because there's so many different uh, you know things you can want to achieve with it. For instance, you might want to say, I, I, wa I want three copies of my data, but I want to guarantee that there's at least one copy in each of two data centers. Or you might want to say that, you know, I have uh, you know, three sets of data, and I want all of them to live in uh, 
each of one data center, but then I want a master copy of each of those pieces, each of those sets of data in a fork. So you see the multi-data center deployment at simply uh, one of the possible conditions you face in distributing your data. It's not a separate engineering task. Now we've got the data center up and running. How do we solve multiple data centers? Right, and, and this this comes out of Cassandra's design as uh, a fully distributed system. There's no special nodes in a Cassandra cluster. Uh, and, and so, so what, what you see in, in a lot of older systems, older designs, is that there will be some kind of master that uh, you know is responsible for a certain range of data and uh, you know, writes, writes will be fast as long as you're in the same data center as that master. But then uh, you know you you know if you want to replicate to another data center, then you can't you can't do writes in that data center. You have to send them over to the master, and then maybe we replicate to the second by log shipping or something like that. So it's kind of you know you know a second system grafted on to the original uh, single data center design. Whereas with uh, Cassandra, uh, you know a second data center is just you know, a, more nodes in the cluster that happen to be across uh, a high latency link. And so Cass Cassandra, you know, replication by and large, everything works exactly the same as in a single data center, with the exception that Cassandra recognizes that, you know, hey, that that gap, that, that, you know, that WAN link is higher latency and more expensive. So what I'm going to do is if, if I need to uh, replicate to multiple nodes that are in that other data center, then, then what, what I'll, I'll do is I'll send that write to a single node with a note that says also forward it to this other node that's local to you so that I so that I minimize my use of that uh, expensive link. Is, do people typically think in terms of one data center being live and the other being a backup, or do you see the entire Cassandra cluster as being simply spread over a wide geographic area and you don't really care where in that cluster you write to? Mostly, you know, pe people find that you know, having that ability to have a multi-master system across data, data centers uh, is really useful uh, because that allows you to have, if you have, if you're serving users on the East Coast and the West Coast or uh, you know, in California and in Europe, uh, you, know, you can have those clients do their updates to you know, the nodes that are closest to them, and uh, so it, it it and you get, you kind of get the geographic redundancy for free, but maybe the the lower latency to your clients is maybe the more important of those two qualities. Walk us through what happens on a right. So on a, on a right, Cassandra's, so you, you can talk to any node in a Cassandra cluster and give it a write, and it will take care of sending it to the right replicas. So this, this is... Uh, can I inter interrupt yes. you there? A client, it can connect to any node in the cluster. There's, right. And do you typically use a load balancer, or how, how does the client find which node to connect to? There's kind of no wrong answer there. Uh, there's there's a bunch of ways you can do it. Uh, my favorite is to use round robin DNS, but uh, you know, we we do see deployments using load balancers like HA proxy or uh, hardware load balancers or even a more kind of uh, client side approach by uh, you know clients like Hector for Java uh, support. You give it a you know any Cassandra node. And it will ask that Cassandra node, hey, tell me about the other nodes in the cluster. And then, uh, then the client will spread its connections around all of, all of those, uh, uh, nodes or, or the ones that are local to it in the same data center. So, uh, you know, Cassandra also supports, uh, a, a, a smart API called the storage proxy API where the client actually routes the data directly to the right replicas. Uh, we, we de-emphasize that a little bit because that's, that's uh, Java only. Uh, but it, it is out there uh, for people who want to use it. We do have uh, you know, at, at least a handful of production deployments using that. But by, but by and large, large uh, 
you know, most most deployments use the Thrift API and use something like Hector uh, on top of that in Java or Picasa in Python and so forth. Uh, so when uh, the, the node that a client uh, connects to uh, is called the coordinator node. And that's, that will be responsible for sending uh, the write out to the write replicas and then reporting back to the client uh, success or failure depend based on what it gets back from those replicas. Uh, so, you know, success or failure is, is a little bit of a fuzzy concept in Cassandra because we support uh, tunable consistency levels, meaning uh, you can tell Cassandra, consider this write a success only if it's uh, written to the majority of replicas for that row. Uh, or you could require just a single uh, replica to be available to consider that write a success and accept that you know it will have to be replicated to the others that are down right now or unreachable uh, at a future point. Does the client control the number of replicas on a write per operation, or do you set that per column family or cluster? Uh, yes. So, in other words, uh, there's, there's two factors to the number of replicas. There's the total number of replicas of a row, and that's, that's set uh, per key space, uh, how many total replicas you want of, of data in that set of column families. Uh, but the number, number of replicas... Uh, we block for before calling a write a success is per operation. So you have two numbers there, the total number of replicas that will eventually be written and the number that you need for a client to, uh, a client right. operation to return. Right. Okay. Now walk us through what happens on a read. A read, a read, uh, gets a little bit more complicated. Uh, so, you know, at the, at the high level, it's it's like a write only you know the other direction. A client talks to a coordinator, says I want you know I want some set of columns from this row, uh, and the coordinator goes out and gets it. You know, drilling down a little further though, things get a little more complicated because uh, you know, we want we want to be efficient. In other words, if I have five copies of a piece of data and you know, I have, for every request, I'm pulling all of those five copies back. Uh, you know, that, that's, that's using up a lot of, of network traffic. I don't want to do that. So what, what Cassandra does, what the coordinator does, is it says, uh, well, first of all, it says how many uh, uh, requests, how, well, what consistency level am I operating at? How many replies do I need to compare to to uh, call this read uh, successful and, and make sure I'm giving the client, you know, as as fresh a copy of the data as it as it's requesting. Uh, and once once it uh, calculates that, it will go through. Cassandra has a subsystem called the failure detector that uh, it, it uses uh, uh, an algorithm uh, that's described in a paper called the Phi failure detector. And, uh, and it, it's a very sophisticated probabilistic uh, failure detection algorithm based on uh, gossip heartbeat. Uh, so, so we can say with, with high accuracy, you know, if, if I haven't received a heartbeat from this node for a few seconds uh, and network traffic has been you know, volatile recently, then you know, he's probably still alive. It's probably just an, another network hiccup. Uh, but you know, you know, the longer it goes, the more likely it is that he's actually you know, really experiencing downtime or a, a long-lived petition. So, so I, I get this list of node of replicas that are uh, you know, that are not failed, and then I take the uh, closest one, uh, and and how we determine closeness uh, is is a, a separate uh, subject we can go into. But I take the closest one. And I say, I want you to send me the data in the columns that are being requested. And the other, the other replicas that I need to satisfy the consistency level, I will send them just a request for a hash of those columns so that you know, I'm, I'm only uh, sending the full body of the, re of the result set once. So it's an optimistic system because most of the time those digests are going to match 
the body, in which case I just say, okay, client, here's, here's your result. Uh, uh, but but if there's a failure, if there's a digest mismatch of, of those hash, hashes, then I have to go and do a, a second round, and I say, okay, this time I'm going to ask for the full body uh, of the result set from everyone, so I can figure out where the you know who's got stale data and send him a more recent uh, copy. We know from the CAP theorem that data stores either fall into the category that emphasize or distributed data stores either emphasize consistency more or availability. Would it be fair to say then that Cassandra is trading off more toward availability and it's willing to give you uh, data that might be a little bit out of date in order to give you something? Cassandra gets put into that category most often, uh, but it's uh, it's more... You know, Cassandra lets you choose which one you want. You know, if, if I... Uh, ask for quorum consistency level on writes and quorum consistency level on reads, then my readers will always see the most recently written values. And so, so it will be a consistent, uh, system. But, uh, you know, that means that I can only, you know, if I have a three, uh, node replication factor, then quorum consistency will only let me lose a single, uh, node before I have to say, uh, I can't fulfill these requests anymore because the system is, you know, too damaged. I've lost too many machines. So often, you know, uh, production deployments will say, you know, I am okay with seeing uh, stale data uh, during failure conditions. So I, I'm going to reduce the, the consistency level I require to get that higher availability. And what happens when you add a node to the cluster? Uh, when you add a node to the cluster, then uh, the existing nodes stream over uh, the data that the new node's becoming responsible for. So uh, part of part of uh, using something like consistent hashing and, and getting uh, you know constant time routing with no uh, central master is that uh, we we ha we do have to move that data to the new one that you know, its position in the token ring indicates that it should be responsible for. So uh, we, we call that bootstrapping, uh, the, the process of, of moving data to uh, a new node in the system. Uh, the good news is, is that because we manage our own data on disk, uh, we can do that without imposing any random I.O. on the system. It's all just sequential reads uh, from the existing machines and sequential writes uh, on the new node. And so, so it's actually, uh, you know, it's over very quickly and, uh, and it's very efficient. How big are some of the clusters that you're seeing your clients use at data stacks? The biggest one that I know of is a uh, cluster running digital reasoning software for the U.S. government that's over 400 nodes. Uh, there's a lot of clusters. That's a, that, that's sort of the, you know, the, the outlier on the size scale. The, the, uh, the mean uh, or, or the mode cluster size, the most common cluster size, is probably between 20 and 40 nodes. Uh, and we do have it at the other end of the spectrum. We, we have one client that's running just, uh, they, they started with just two nodes uh, because you know, they knew they wanted to scale and that uh, you know, Cassandra would be able to do that seamlessly uh, and they didn't, they didn't have to start with a huge cluster to begin with. Is each node in the cluster then running the Phi failure detection algorithm? Yes. And then uh, if a node goes down, then other nodes would fairly quickly identify it as down using this algorithm. Mm -hmm. And do they go through a reverse of the node addition process to create enough replicas for data that was on the failed node? That's a good question because what we actually do is we don't assume that a node is dead permanently until a human in intervenes and says, okay, he's not coming back. Because the most common failure condition is some kind of temporary failure, whether uh, whether it's a switch that failed and so the node's unreachable, or a circuit was overloaded and the node goes down, but you know all the data is still there. Uh, having a node that's absolutely wiped out and the data doesn't exist anymore is relatively rare. So we don't we don't want to impose the overhead of uh, you know rebuilding that data 
uh, you know, until it, until someone says it, it is necessary. Uh, and that's that's the nice thing about having uh, you know, a, you know, a replication factor that's you know, basically as high as you want, but the com the most common one is is replication factor three, because you know if you just have a single replica, uh, well, there's a couple drawbacks of that. You know, one is that uh, a quorum of two is still two, so so you don't have if you're doing quorum consistency, you can't lose anything before you have to start uh, denying requests. But the other is that uh, from a you know, I don't want to lose my data point of view. If I have two replicas and one of them goes down, then I'm I'm really really nervous uh, until I can re-replicate it, because now you know when one's down, I just have a single copy, and if I lose that, then game over. Uh, but if you have a replication factor of three, then you know even if I lose one uh, one copy, you know I'm I'm still feeling confident because I still have two copies, and uh, you know, I don't start to get nervous again until, you know, I in, unless I lose the second one before the first one comes back online or gets re-replicated. What about the case where you have two data centers and you lose a data center or they lose communication? You've configured it to put one replica in the other data center. Then at that point, would you want the, uh, if you think you've lost the data center for a while, would you want the surviving data center to re-replicate data so you have your desired number of copies within that data center? Usually, usually not, because again, you know, if I lose the entire data center, then uh, it, <clears throat> it's probably uh, you know some kind of network problem, and that that data center will be back online uh, you know, within. Probably hours, you know, worst case, probably days, uh, and so you know you, you replicate uh, in Cassandra uh, to you know to protect your data, not to not not to improve performance. Uh, so maybe that you know people coming from a relational database background, you may be thinking, well, you know, I'll, I'll create more replicas to handle more traffic, but uh, the 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 right way to handle more traffic in Cassandra is to add more machines and spread your uh, data across more machines rather than increasing the the replication count, which would you know just put more copies across the same number of machines. And because remember that you know we're we're doing that comparing of digests uh, of of uh, of the different replicas. Uh, with with uh, the data on each read, so uh, and so in general, unless you know, there, there's some some caveats, you can turn off read repair, for instance. But in you know in the out of the box configuration, you don't add more capacity by adding replicas. Uh, you, you you add more capacity by adding more machines and spreading those replicas you know, more thinly across those machines. You just mentioned read repair. Tell us how that works. So read repair means that even if I say, even if, if I do a read at consistency level one, which which says, you know, just give me, you know, the result from the the, the closest replica, uh, Cassandra will in the background uh, go ahead and after it gives you that reply, it will go and ask the other replicas for digests of what it just read. So it can make sure that that they are uh, up to date. Uh, so that's one of the three ways that Cassandra keeps its replication uh, in sync. So there, there's uh, there's no way to to break Cassandra's replication such that it has to rebuild from scratch, uh, which, which is which is a really nice property. Uh, you know, coming from uh, a relational background, you know, I I've uh, you know I've seen a, a Sloney uh, replication for PostgreSQL, you know, just you know, the only way to to uh, make it recover would, was to you know, rebuild the slave from scratch. You really don't want to have to do that in a production environment. No, and no, no, and no because not only is it uh, does it impose a very large uh, you know, performance penalty while you're doing that, you know, it also means that you're in that situation where now I just have that one copy of my data and I'm nervous. Uh, you know, if something goes wrong while I'm rebuilding, I'm 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 not in a happy place. 
So uh, the, the three ways that Cassandra uses to, to keep its replication up to date are uh, read repair that we mentioned, uh, hinted handoff, and anti-entropy repair. And all of, all of those terms come from the Amazon Dynamo paper, and they're a little, they, they don't mean anything to you unless you've read that paper. So, uh, briefly, uh, what those other two mean, hinted handoff means that, uh, if I'm doing a write and the failure detector lets me know, hey, you know, this, this replica of this write is down, uh, then, uh, if, well, it, I'll, then one of two things will happen. If, I don't have enough replicas alive to satisfy the consistency level, then I'll tell the client, uh, you know, I'll, I'll give it an unavailable exception that says, you know, there aren't enough live replicas to satisfy your request. Uh, but, but if I do have enough live replicas to satisfy the request, then I will send one of the live ones uh, a piece of metadata with the write that says, replay this write uh, to this, this, this replica that, that's down right now. When he comes back up, replay it. So that, that's called, that's called a hint. And, and the replay process is called handoff. So that, that's where that, that's where that term comes from. Uh, then the, the third, uh, way to achieve consistency is, uh, the anti-entropy repair. And that's, uh, basically, uh, you know, it's basically RC for databases. So what we're going to do is uh, we're going to build a tree of hashes uh, for each range of data in the, in the replica, and uh, we exchange those hash trees in such a way that uh, we, we find out which data blocks are uh, out of sync in logarithmic time, and we're only exchanging those hashes over the network until we, we find what is actually out of sync, and then we, then we uh, repair that. So we efficiently compare trees without having to send the entire trees back. And forth. Yeah, I mean, worst case, you will send the entire tree back and forth, but you know that that would be the case of I, you know, I rm dash rf my data directories and nothing's there anymore. Uh, when when there is data that that's shared between them, even if it's only a little bit, then uh, Cassandra will will be able to avoid replicating uh, that part. I'd like to switch gears and talk about the storage model you mentioned very early on in the interview. Tell us, uh, give us an overview of the storage model that Cassandra uses. So, so far we've been talking about in terms of replication and consistency level of uh, Cassandra's kind of dynamo heritage. And then moving to the storage model, then we, we're kind of switching gears to uh, you know, the, the big table influence. And so actually big table actually wasn't the, uh, uh, first to describe uh, this kind of storage model, which is uh, you know, a log-structured storage model for databases. Uh, that comes from a paper in 1996 called The Log-Structured Merge Tree. And uh, that, that paper didn't get a whole lot of attention until Google cited it uh, in Bigtable uh, 10 years later. But what, uh, what happens you know, at the storage layer when a replica, when a write comes into a replica, uh, that belongs on that node is, uh, you know, so, you know, you, nor, most, uh, most databases use a, a B tree based storage model that's more or less update in place. Uh, you know, there's, there's, uh, uh, you know, there's a little bit of a wrinkle from things like multi version and concurrency control, but you can pretty much think of it as, as an update in place storage model where, you know, there's a certain a block of data that a row lives in, and then we follow an index down to find that block, and then we update the columns uh, for uh, for an update request. Now, in, in Cassandra, what we do instead is, uh, when we have updates come in for a column family, we put them in a structure called a mem table, and we bat we we collect we collect updates. We don't we don't uh, turn those into a file on disk until the mem table is full. And then we, we sort the mem table by row, and then we write it out uh, to disk where we call it an SS table. You know, it's a, it's a data file. And once it's written on disk, it's immutable. We never do update in place. Uh, we, we only we, we update by putting a new version in a new mem table and eventually writing that out to a new data file. 
Is the node serve writes or reads and writes out of the mem table? Yes, so the data in the mem table is live for read requests immediately. And what we'll do is if, if, uh, you know, if I have a row for my user record, uh, on, on a website, and, uh, so my company changed its name recently from Riptano to Datastack. So in my profile, I have my URL, it says riptano.com. And then I come in and say, hey, you know, I changed my company name, so I'm going to change my URL to datastacks.com. Well, I have my original uh, uh, record on disk in an SS table file. Now I have my new URL in a mem table uh, that hasn't been written to disk yet. So if someone comes in and says, uh, you know, the equivalent of select star from users where uh, your username is JD Ellis, then I will, you know, Cassandra will merge that new value that's sitting in the mem table with the row that's on disk and say, you know, this new value supersedes the one that was in the row on disk. The rest of the data that was on disk is still current, so I'll, I'll, I'll present that uh, in the result set as is. Does a write complete successfully before anything's been written to disk? Short, short answer is no, uh, because before we put the uh, data in the mem table, we append it to a commit log. Uh, so this is the same kind of uh, architecture that you know, you know, traditional databases use to provide durability is you know, we append to commit log and then uh, the, the tunable uh, parameter here is how often do we f-sync that commit log? In other words, how often do we tell the operating system to actually send that data in the commit log to disk? Uh, and so if, if you have your commit log on a separate device than the data files that you're doing reads from, then, you know, you're just constantly doing appends. That's a very, you know, that's a very fast operation because I'm not having to seek the disk head around. Uh, but, uh, you know, and, and so this is the same for uh, relational databases as for Cassandra, or at least commit log oriented relational databases. Uh, that, that you want to have that on that, on that separate device and performance is worse if it's not. Now, uh, there is kind of a workaround for, you know, having it, uh, you know, on a non-performant environment, which is that we're, we'll only f-sync every so many seconds. Instead of, instead of, uh, grouping up writes into, into groups of, say, uh, you know, uh, 10 milliseconds worth of writes and, and f-syncing those together, or one millisecond worth of writes and f-syncing those together, uh, we will, uh, because, you know, even if it's on its own device, you don't want to f-sync for each individual uh, write. You want to batch those up somehow. Uh, but we can relax that and say we're, we'll only f-sync, you know, every 10 seconds, uh, no matter how many writes come in, to give you better performance if you have to have your commit log on a shared disk with your data files. What you're trying to do here then is support a lot of writes without having to do a lot of seeks on the spindle. Exactly. Are there clients for all the popular programming languages? Well, I guess that depends on uh, what you call popular. Uh, there's there's two levels to the to the client story in Cassandra. There's there's uh, you know, the the raw communication protocol is uh, an RPC framework, uh, RPC and serialization framework called Thrift, uh, and that you know, generates code for uh, you know around a dozen languages, uh, and and yeah, I, I think that does cover pretty much all the popular ones. Uh, actually, one the the only one that I've had someone request a client for that that Thrift doesn't handle is Delphi, so that. But you know, C sharp, uh, Erlang, OCaml, uh, Smalltalk, uh, uh, Java, Perl, Ruby, Python. Yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, you know, even some fairly obscure ones like those others, you know, Thrift does support. But then Thrift is really the right way to think about Thrift is that it's kind of the driver. So sort of like libpq for PostgreSQL. You, you you don't really want to write your application code with Thrift RPC calls. If you can possibly help it, and so that that's where it's it's a little more sparse. We have clients for 
uh, Java, for Python, for Ruby, for PHP, and those are the ones that are that are really well supported. Uh, oh, C sharp as well. Uh, but uh, C++ is uh, a little more touchy. Uh, there's there's a uh, client out there that that needs a little bit of fleshing out to be a really full fledged uh, uh, environment. Uh, Perl uh, is another one where uh, there there isn't a really good uh, client that's up to date for the Cassandra 07 features. Those are those are the two main ones that we'd like to see. I think uh, a little better story with the C plus plus and Perl. Does Cassandra support anything like transactions? It supports something like transactions, but not transactional per se. So when we think of transactions, we think of you know the atomic, isolated, consistent, and durable. Uh, well, Cassandra gives you durable, and you know, if it wasn't clear uh, in my description earlier, you absolutely can configure Cassandra so that uh, uh, every write is 100% durable. Even if you lose power, uh, every write that was acknowledged will be there when you come back up. Uh, so we do durability, and we, we do atomicity with, within limits. Uh, so atomicity means that you know, if I give you a write, either all of it will happen or none of it. Uh, and Cassandra gives you atomicity within a, a single row. Uh, that that's the uh, that's the level of of what we put in a commit log, and the level of and that's the level of uh, uh, routing of of uh, data and partitioning. But you know, more broadly, when people think of transactions, they say, well, you know, I want updates to these different tables, and I want I want all of those to you know happen as a group. And so Cassandra doesn't give you atomicity across multiple different rows. Uh, but what it does give you is this concept called a batch. So that's sort of the, that's, that's the thing that's like a transaction to Cassandra, is you can have a batch of updates and you send it off to Cassandra. And if, you know, what you need to worry about is the coordinator node failing partway through. That's, that's the edge case there. Uh, if the coordinator node fails partway through, then the client needs to fail over to another uh, node to talk to a new coordinator, and and that's one of the things that good clients handle for you. Like you know Hector and Picasa, you know they're going to handle that for you, and then you retry the batch. And and the property of the batches is that you know even if part of it got applied already, retrying it uh, will be item potent, and 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 uh, only the you know the parts that weren't applied. Will happen, and the parts that already did, you know, no harm done, was were, were still cool. If you're designing a highly normalized, highly denormalized database where there's multiple copies of the same data for different queries, you could have batches that are partially completed. Then, isn't it the case that the clients would have to be prepared to deal with what we would call referential integrity failures during reads? You you have to worry about that. If you're not fully denormalized, if you're only partially denormalized, then you have to worry about that because you know partially denormalized means I'm doing some kind of joins uh, client side, and, and that's where you have to worry about that. If you're fully denormalized, such that you know each query is coming from one of these materialized view rows, then you know the data in that row, you know because you know I said data within a row is atomic, you don't have to worry about that. Okay, got it. So it either succeeds right. or it doesn't, right. but it's if we could proceed to talk a little bit about the project, tell us about the structure of Cassandra as an open source project. Well, Cassandra's really, uh, it's a great open source success story. I mentioned that I started working on Cassandra while I was at Rackspace. Uh, you know, we, we started getting engineers from Dig and Twitter working on it. Today we have substantially over 100 uh, people who've contributed at least one patch. And more who contributed bug reports and so forth. You know, Rackspace, you know, for instance, wasn't looking to build something solo. It, it's it's really been you know today. Uh, you know, Datastax has you know, quite a few people on it full time, but it, it it's still uh, it's still a very healthy community where 
uh, you know, it's developed in the open. Pe you know, people from different companies are working on it together, uh, and it, it's it's one of the healthiest uh, communities in that respect that I've that I've uh, seen. In fact. Do you have mailing lists, wiki, forum, things like that? Yeah, we, uh, there's there's uh, a user mailing list, a developer mailing list, a client developer mailing list. Uh, a lot of the action, you, you've kind of seen this in, in, the, in the open source world in general in the last few years, is uh, you know, projects have moved a little bit more towards real-time communication. Uh, and so younger projects... Uh, I think I think there's a common trend towards emphasizing something like IRC a little bit more than mailing lists, uh, and we have we we do a lot of our uh, development in the Cassandra Dev channel on Freenode, and uh, there's there's a just pound Cassandra channel for users there that consistently has about a couple hundred people there, and uh, basically pretty much any time zone you're in you can get uh, you can get uh, real time help. Uh, in IRC, and you know, there, there's there's also the mailing list for more involved discussions or more, uh, you know, more high latency, I guess. If people want to find out more about the project, where should they go? Uh, they should go to uh, Apache. Uh, Cassandra, uh, sorry, other way around, Cassandra.apache.org, uh, and I would I would particularly recommend the wiki page uh, called Articles and Presentations. And uh, that that has uh, um, several high quality uh, you know, articles uh, about Cassandra uh, at the top of the page. Tell us about your company, DataStax. So I started uh, DataStax uh, about eight months ago. We called it Riptano and recently changed our name. And uh, we we provide uh, professional products and support for Cassandra. We have over fifty. Uh, you know, support uh, customers, and uh, then you know, then there's the customers that we've done uh, product design and training with. It's uh, it's going really well. Uh, this week at Strata, we're we're introducing our Cassandra management uh, platform called Ops Center, and uh, and starting to give that out to uh, you know, interested data users. Do you personally write or blog anywhere? I do most of my blogging these days on the DataStacks website. Uh, so data, I think it's datastacks.com slash blog, but it's definitely linked uh, from the main site. And I'm, I'm uh, spiced on Twitter, S-P-Y-C-E-D, uh, for sort of obscure historical reasons. We will have a link to that and all the academic or research papers that you've mentioned in the show notes. So, Jonathan Ellis, thank you very much for talking to Software Engineering Radio. Thanks for having me on the program. Thanks for listening to Software Engineering Radio. SA Radio is an educational program brought to you by Hillside Europe. If you want more information about the podcast and the other episodes, visit our website at se-radio.net. If you want to support us, you can donate to the SE Radio team via the website or you can advertise for SE Radio, for example, by clicking on the Dick Reddit Delicious and Slashdot buttons or by talking about us on Twitter and Facebook. You can also support us by joining the team and shouldering some of the work. To contact the team, please send an email to team at se-radio.net or if your feedback is specific to an episode, please use the comments facility on the website so other people can react to your comments. This episode of SE Radio, as well as all other episodes, are licensed under a Creative Commons 2.5 license. Please see the website for details. Yeah.